The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Thank you. Uh, and how awesome is our God? How big is our God? In a submission to guideposts, the parents of a three-year-old or a, a third-grade daughter submitted the following in part. She was thanking God. She was saying, how is it possible that you have the ability to love every single person in every single country on this planet when I have such a hard time trying to love my 10-year-old brother? <laughs> as far as announcements this morning, um, up by the offering bucket, there are ballots uh, wrapped in a rubber band so they don't blow away. These ballots are for the meeting, the congregational meeting we will have immediately following this service on uh, the voting for the new church administrator, Irene Hershey. Um, as you can or are able to, try to get one of those ballots uh, before, uh, during, or after the service so that uh, you can properly vote. I've also been reminded that the upper room booklets for September and October 2020 are located also by the offering bucket. And of course the offering bucket is where we can put our tithes and offerings as well. Uh, I believe that's it for announcements. Or not. <laughs> Today is a full day. It is rally day. And we will have chicken available. There we go. We will have chicken available after the service. There are 200 and... 37 meals um, to pick up chicken there are four lines A, B, C, and D form behind those lines stay socially distanced and then you can walk up to the table one of our uh, F and H people are coming down Angela <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it right so far. Um, okay. So, form lines, there are four cones, A, B, C, and D in the parking lot, four lines behind that. You can send one family member, y'all don't have to go. Um, and then when the person in front of you leaves, move ahead. We're not crossing lines, this isn't like the bank. Uh, if, you, if you're an A initially, there's an A, a uh, table that you will then be served at. Uh, anything else? Yes. Um, how about Randy's? Can I just borrow your microphone? Good morning. Um, so chicken is a little bit different this year, and we're working out a few kinks. We have a lot of chicken, but we just want to be sure that we have enough chicken. Um, so we're asking that you get chicken for your family. And this chicken has been sponsored by various church committees. So the chicken for your family is free. If then there is chicken left over, we have that available by donation. Um, and so that will be a separate table. Sorry if that is confusing. Um, you'll also be requesting as you come up whether you want dark meat or white meat. Thank you. Just two more quick things. Um, this has been a full time. We had a wedding yesterday on the Kettering Farm for Bree Hummer and Tyler Bear. That was a beautiful service. Next Sunday afternoon, uh, there will be a memorial service for Marty Stauffer here. 
and Wednesday, a week and a half from now, the 23rd, there will be a memorial service for both Bob and Sylvia Hefley. So we wanted to make you aware. Please keep those families in prayer, and uh, we look forward to seeing you. Thank you, Doug. As Doug mentioned, this is Rally Day, so we welcome any guests or any friends, neighbors that you may have brought along with you, and we hope that the service is enriching and meaningful to them. And introduce them around after the service so that we may get to know them better. Thank you. The call to worship this morning comes from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. Paul writes to Timothy, Although I hope to come see you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Can we bow our heads in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us a beautiful day to celebrate you and to worship you outside. We thank you for the times we were able to get together and worship you throughout the summer and the meaningful experiences different sometimes but all helped us get closer to you and to just face a different atmosphere as we came to praise and worship you on Sunday morning we invoke your presence this morning Lord in this service and that you bless all of those who will participate in the service and that would include every one of us who will sing the praises and listen to your word we ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us as we continue in our praise to God.
past several months have seemed like a very dark place, but we know you are the way maker. We know you're moving in our midst. We know you're here working. And so we come here to worship you. We know you're the miracle worker and the promise keeper, and you've promised that you will always be with us. And this morning we come together to worship you, knowing that those promises are true. Lord, be the light in our darkness. Amen. All right, we're going to get your feet moving now, if they haven't been already. <laughs> opportunity to support James Wenger as he, as this afternoon is Jacoby's bike ride that he will be taking part in. So James is seated directly in front of us here. Would you please bow your heads as we pray together? Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for the wonderful day that you have provided us and the opportunity we have to freely gather together in your name to thank you, to worship you, to ask for forgiveness and your mercy and grace on us for any times we have failed you. Lord, we thank you for the love that you've shown us in more ways than we can count, in more ways than we're even capable of imagining. But most of all, through the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
who died for everyone seated here this morning. Lord, we can never repay the cost that was laid upon you in giving up your son, Jesus. The best we can do is try as we are able to serve you, to worship you, to praise you in the best way we can. Lord, we thank you for protecting us and our community, for the most part, from the flooding, the violence, and the wildfires currently affecting many of our brothers and sisters across the country. May you bless those firefighters who are tirelessly volunteering themselves from across the country to go out and fight these fires in California, in Washington State, in Oregon. Lord, comfort those who have suffered loss of life, loss of property, loss of their livelihoods throughout this devastation. Comfort them and protect those who are trying to heal them and help them in your name. Thank you for the blessings far beyond what we deserve. The blessings of life itself, for it's not to be taken for granted. And we're finding this out through this coronavirus. And we mourn the loss of those who have lost loved ones during this pandemic. And those who are caring for the sick. Lord, we ask that you bless those military personnel who are valiant, valiantly serving us and protecting us from uh, protecting our freedoms. We ask that you look after them, protect them, and we also ask that you protect those missionaries who are serving you throughout the world, including our own Deb Fody from Vietnam. Lord, protect them as they try to spread your word among those who haven't heard. Lord, we ask that you come up with a cure or help those come up with a cure or a vaccine, or some remedy for this coronavirus that is affecting us as a world. We pray for each of the nations, as their leadership and our own, try to get a handle on this pandemic and that the decisions they make would help us. Lord, we pray for the safety of all those who all those workers who make up the villages and community we serve, as each of us is essential to the work that you've called us to do. Please protect our children and grandchildren as they return to school, and those teachers and school staff you've called to educate and serve them. We pray for the safety of those in law enforcement, trying to keep peace and order throughout these difficult times. Lord, we pray for the sick and the ailing and those who are hurting in our own church. Lord, you know their names, you know their conditions, and we ask that you look after them, heal them if that is in your will, and comfort and care and give strength to those who are caring for them. Lord, we think this morning of Mary Lou Ruth, as her father, Russell Pryor, was admitted to the hospital. May you heal Russell, may you help the family, and may you comfort Mary Lou as she deals with this. We thank you for the guests that are with us this morning and that they may be enriched by the experience in worshiping you with us. 
We bless all who have made, prepared, and will serve these chicken dinners that we will all enjoy and benefit from following the service. We ask that you look over the vote that we will be taking for Irene Hershey as we call her to be our next church administrator and serve us in that capacity. Bless James Wenger, Lord, and please, and please keep him safe as he rides today in a bike ride for Kobe's. So many people will benefit from what he has raised and what Co the work that Kobe's does. Lord, we ask you to be with Pastor Doug this morning as he delivers your message to us. Give him the words to inspire to, and to challenge us as we go forward from this place. Lord, we ask all these things in your son Jesus Christ's name, who taught us to pray that perfect prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A scripture this morning comes again from Paul in a letter to Timothy. This is 1 Timothy verses, chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior, of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, or murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. Welcome you today in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and risen Savior, as we begin our fall series on the pastoral letters. It's what they've come become to know, uh, be known as. Paul's letters to First and Second Timothy, or Paul's two letters to Timothy and one to Titus, and we're also going to hit Philemon. Now, through the summer, we have studied the Ten Commandments as well as the commandment that Christ gave us. He called his disciples to love one another as he has loved us. And we'll touch on this later as we talk about the pillar of which we build our faith on, as Paul mentions in uh, 1 Timothy 3. So first off, who was Timothy? Timothy was a young man from Galatia. And we believe he encountered Paul back in Acts. 
If you go to Acts 16, the first three verses say, Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. And a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, we believe Timothy to be a young man, but maybe not as young as we first thought. Looking through the commentaries, I looked at N.T. Wright, uh, Fee, and Barclay. Timothy could have been in his early 30s when he started following with Paul, possibly late 20s. And in order to further the kingdom, he was freely circumcised. I just want to have that in the back of our mind. That is not a pleasant process. This is why, you know, they would do this on the eighth day after being born, not in their 28th year of life. But he freely did this so that the gospel message could be proclaimed in a bolder sense. And Timothy walked with Paul in many places. He was with Paul in Berea, Athens, Macedonia, Corinth, Thessal Thessalonica. If Paul could not be there, Timothy was. Timothy was with Paul when Paul wrote the, the second letter to the Corinthians, the first letter to the Thessalonians. He was with Paul in prison when Philippians was written, Colossians and the letter to Philemon. He was his true son, his genuine son in the faith. And Timothy was willing to go anywhere that Paul went. And if you remember, through our study of Corinthians, Timothy was one of the messengers sent in place of Paul. Now, when this was written, there was a lot going on in Rome and in the greater country. And Barclay talks about this, and I just want to touch on a couple things. There were wars within the country and wars with enemies, and sometimes they would overlap. There were cities that were on fire set by their own people. There was greed and corruption in high places, in religious settings, in political settings. The country was in disarray. And people did whatever they could to protect themselves and to get forward. It was a very philosophical, very religious, and very political culture. And Paul warns Timothy what men are to avoid what men should not focus on in the body of Christ. He talks about mere speculations, the straying from truth that leads to fruitless discussion. Does any of this sound familiar? Does any of this ring true today? As I think about today's culture and Paul's culture, I wonder what these things lead to, these mere speculations, these straying from the truth, this fruitless discussion. It leads to broken trust, factions within bodies, pointless and aimless anger, hurt, there's no solid ground. There's a promotion of self. And he 
goes on to say what these men are teaching, and that's the fact that they don't even understand what they're teaching. And what's intriguing to me is his list then corresponds with four or five of the Ten Commandments right in a row. If anyone knew the law, it was Paul. In verse 9, he says, realizing the fact that the law was not made for the righteous person, and we're going to get back to that, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and profane. These were people who did not know God, who would sin and break relationships, who did not know any better, but also within this list, for people who did know better, for people who did know God, for people who walked away and would openly rebel against God, who would not receive any correction nor authority, but openly did what they want, and they wanted, no matter how it affected other people. He says, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, Honor your father and mother. For murderers, do not kill. For immoral men and homosexuals, do not commit adultery. For kidnappers, do not steal. For liars, do not commit false witness. And perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. Paul's reminding them what the law said. And who it was intended for. But for followers of Christ, who are you? Are you the unrighteous or the righteous? Have you accepted the work of the cross and Christ's call on your life to die to yourself? If you are seeking to be transformed by Jesus, by his life, by his spirit, by his teaching, you are no longer the unrighteous, but the righteous. And your commandment is to love others as Christ has loved us. So what are we to focus on? In verse 11, it says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, we're to focus on the glorious gospel. The gospel means good news. The news that sets people free. The news that reconciles relationships. The news that brings peace and understanding and hope. In verse 1, he says, God is Savior. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son. God as Savior. You know who else carried that title in, Gre in Greco-Roman culture? There was a God of healing, and Caesar began to take that name as Savior. Caesar started giving himself the name of Savior. And who does Paul call as Savior? God. God and God alone. Christ as hope. Where is your hope set? Where is your foundation? Why is Christ our hope? You know, getting on social media, I, I wonder what it's like to see all of the problems of the world, all of the problem, all these huge problems that seem out of our control and unable to fix the brokenness in our justice system, the tension between the different colors in our country, the tension between the different parties in our country. You see wildfires and wars and plagues and famines happening right now all across the world. And if you get sucked into that and you get wrapped into that, you can begin to feel hopeless. You can begin to feel lost. And I'm like... 
how can you see all this and know all this? What, what should I do? What did Jesus do? He knew all these things. He saw all these things. Did it shake him from his mission? Did it shake him from why he came here? Absolutely not. He poured into the three and poured into the twelve. He preached to thousands and thousands walked away from him. He did not lose focus. He spoke what the Father told him. He lived as God would live. And he brought the kingdom of God in so that we could see it and we could participate also. He is our hope. Paul goes on to say grace, mercy, and peace to Timothy. Grace is this active generosity, this active forgiveness. Where instead of holding on to a mistake or holding on to uh, a pain, you can forgive someone and you can show them another way. You can respond in a different way. Anyone ever do something wrong and expect to be punished? Most of us have and did. When we do something wrong, sometimes it's that, it's that gut pain we get in our, in our stomach. And then have you had grace extended to you? Have you ever expected to be punished and then not? Even though you were called out? It's transforming. It's renewing. And you know not to make that same choice again. Peace. This isn't peace like there's no trouble. This is peace that even in the midst of everything else that's going on, your foundation is secure. Your hope is set. And you can speak and see clearly. And mercy. Mercy that we've all received from Christ. The mercy when he comes into our life and comes alongside of us and walks with us and pulls us up. Paul says to Timothy, grace, peace, and mercy to you. Could we use some grace, peace, and mercy right now? Could we use some hope? Paul says in verse 5, But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. A good heart. A sincere faith. Our conscience. That no matter what happens, Christ is King. That no matter the fruitless conversations that happen, we can freely do what we need to so that others will be open to hear the message. That we're doing everything we can not to cause others to stumble. That we're doing everything we can to show them the love that Christ has shown us. Even if they come down on us. Even if they condemn us. When our focus is where it belongs, the storm calms and we hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. And we're no longer shaken by everything that's going on. 
instead of seeing enemies, we see another person that either needs to see Christ or remind them who they are in Christ. And that peace that surpasses all understanding becomes ours. You know, I want us to keep in mind this fall and going into the spring and what the kingdom of heaven looks like. Do we expect to see maskers or non-maskers there? Democrats or Republicans? Methodists, Baptists? If we can acknowledge that they will be in the kingdom of heaven with us, will that shift how we interact with them? If we keep our focus first on Christ and then on each other and love them as Christ loved us, can it shift the conversation? Instead of competing against one another or condemning one another, we can pray for one another. We can praise one another. And we keep our focus beyond this current time into when our hope is fulfilled. I am excited to see where God will lead us as a body, and not only as this body, but as bodies in the community and local brethren bodies as we build those bridges, as we love one another as Christ loved us, and as we heed Paul's call that we may love from a pure heart and a good conscience and know how to conduct ourselves as the family of God while we're here on this earth. May you go this week and live out your faith so that when people look at you and hear you, they see Jesus Christ our Lord who fills you with his Holy Spirit. I'm going to invite the praise band back up. Um, we're going to have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for who you are and how you have revealed yourself to us through the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. We admit, Father, that we can get wrapped up in the torrents of our time, that we can become doubtful and hurt, that we can lose hope, when we pull our focus from you. And yet, as we have sung in the past, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus and his righteousness. Let our feet rest on that solid ground that we may live with a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith that we may see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you, Father, for this beautiful, beautiful day. And we lift this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us as we lift our voices and praise to God. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus.